Welcome to Let's Talk Kettering, and thank you for joining us today. Um, today with me is Dan Wathen and Brett Davenport from the Kettering Fire Department, and we're going. The topic for uh, this session is to talk about how emergency medical services have evolved over the years, and talk about some of the technological advances um, that we employ today to save lives and, and improve the quality of our citizens. So, welcome, gentlemen. Thank, thank you. you. Um, to, to begin, we want to capture a scope of how EMS has evolved. Um, and to do that, we're going to take a, a stroll back through history to 1983, when Dan Wathen began his, uh, his career in the fire service. So Dan, if you can kind of describe to us how emergency medical services were perceived in the role of fire department operations back in the early 80s. Okay, well in the early 80s is when the paramedics became very popular departments were starting to get paramedics on and Kettering had some of their own but the numbers were very limited so in order to perform those life-saving skills that they've learned in their education we only had a few to put on throughout uh, the day and it was quite often one paramedic and numerous other first responders EMT based people so when the paramedic got a critical call like a cardiac arrest like someone having a stroke uh, a trauma their uh, expertise had to be spread out over taking care of many aspects of that call. Uh, once they realized that paramedics were extremely valuable and more people became educated, we had more available and as the years went on, we will have more paramedics uh, on the apparatus to be able to perform these tasks simultaneously to hopefully save more lives. Um, so by the time I continued on my career and got my paramedics in 1990, um, quite a few years after, the numbers were considerably um, increased for that and we were able to um, provide more time when we had more paramedics on, but we still relied a lot on EMT basics and first responders to assist us, and then sometimes they were the only ones on calls be due to resources. But as time went on, I know that um, you know, we obviously have a larger number of paramedics available now. So would you say in the early years, um, the department ran uh, a basic life support and advanced life support, but the number of available paramedics was significantly less. Exactly. The, the numbers were, were so small that we weren't able to provide it across the board, uh, advanced life support to the city of Kettering. But also at that time, how would you have described our call volume uh, back in the, the early 90s in the demand and need for these medical services compared to what we see today? It was definitely a lot less. Uh, Number-wise, we have probably more than doubled um, in the last 15, 20 years, the request for EMS. But I think a lot of that is people being educated that we have the paramedics available to provide these uh, life-saving skills where we didn't in the past. So I think people were reluctant to think that we really could make a difference if they called us. Now they know we can make a difference because of all of our new technology and, and ability to get to people in a timely manner. So. I think there's a lot of factors varied out in, in our, what our responses were in numbers. And I think, um, but they definitely were a lot less uh, back then. So we definitely you know, didn't need as many as we do today. So fast forward to today. Um, Brett, how would you describe the emergency medical services that we provide today to our citizens? Like Dan said, um, the call volume has definitely increased, um, so we've almost more than doubled, like Dan said. So 80% of our call volume, roughly, is emergency medicine. So today we, we have paramedics that are going to be on every piece of apparatus, um, whether it be a, a medic or a fire engine. So we're, we're able to staff with advanced life support um, and transport and, and provide better quality of care to the citizens of Kettering. And probably in reality, back in the early 90s, it was typical for our department to run somewhere around probably less than 2,000 emergency medical calls a, a per year. Um, fast forward to this year, we are uh, currently on pace to run well over 7,000 emergency medical calls. So the demand and need for, for emergency medical services has drastically increased. And over the years, as that increase has um, has taken place, the department has responded by hiring additional paramedics um, over the course of time to be able to provide that service. Now, Brett, you touched on um, having paramedics on not only the medic units that people mm -hmm. traditionally think about 
uh, emergency medicine, but you said also that you, we have paramedics on the fire engines and the ladder trucks. Absolutely. Why is that important? It's important for most likely, like Dan said, critical care calls. If we have someone who's suffering a stroke or a cardiac arrest or something, uh, anything that an ambulance will have on it to make it advanced life support, we carry on our fire engines, which what that en enables us to do is provide better care for the citizens. So we can have, you know, roughly five people show up and, and better serve the citizens by having more advanced life support care there. And when we talk about <coughs> advanced life support, and we'll get into this a little bit more, we're talking about the level of training and the actual skills that a paramedic right. can, can bring to that emergency scene over and above simply giving the patient oxygen or providing basic CPR. Right. So these critical skills, having a multitude of folks arrive on scene at the same time to be able to initiate these critical care, critical skills, what does that do to, to our patient care and our patient outcomes? Well, with that, you know, since we are sending more people, it, it's more of a manpower issue with that. We're able to get more tasks done more efficiently now. Um, you know, if I can focus on one task while Dan can focus on another, uh, we're able to get better quality to the citizens and, and we can staff and, and perform better for overall. So the overall quality of care, it's fair to say, has drastically improved because we're not only sending folks quickly to the scene, but, but those personnel are trained at a higher level to be able to initiate simultaneous care. And that might be starting an IV, exactly. inserting a right. tube to help someone breathe, defibrillating if a heart is stopped, <clears throat> and all of those things can take place simultaneously Whereas back in the early 80s when there was less uh, numbers of medical professionals because the fire service didn't have as large a demand, it may have been only, as Dan, you said, one paramedic there. So those skills had to happen in succession rather than could all happen at the same time. Exactly. And that's, that's been one of the biggest improvements was being able to perform these tasks simultaneously um, so we can get the person much uh, quicker to the hospital for the definitive care that they need. Right. Um, and we're not spending as much time at the house with them, and we're able to get some good care, whether it be medication or uh, EKGs, different treatments we can give now that have improved dramatically over the years. And studies have shown all of those initial actions have drastically improved survivability and patients' care of life, quality of life when they leave the hospital. So those are all excellent things that, that are have been part of this evolution. Um, let's go back again to, to the early 80s and talk about, and even 90s as you started paramedics, the training requirements. We're, we're talking about all these things that paramedics are able to do today. Were you able to do all those same skills and, and things back when you first went through being a paramedic? Well, actually, there's quite a few things we can do now that we weren't able to do back uh, many years ago. So the training was actually much less than it is today, and it'll be interesting to see the difference, uh, what it was for me as opposed to what Brett had to go through. Um, I took a, a course about nine months, which is the same as any other high school or you know kid would take. Started in sept September. I was out, graduated, and got my degree by the end of May or June. Um, but we didn't have as much to learn. We did learn, you know, the important things of, of cardiac problems and, and how to treat some of the significant emergencies and start IVs. We learned those skills, but we certainly have learned a, learned a lot more since. And the only way that myself, having only taken a course for nine months, have become more proficient in all the changes is utilizing con constant continuing education in the department. So we have training uh, constantly. Every month at least we have uh, emergency medical services training that helps us keep up with our skills and when new ones are introduced it enables us to become more proficient in those. And I know with Brett your, your training was quite a bit longer when it, you got yours. Absolutely it was longer. I, I went through the program finished in 2007. Uh, at that time it was a total of about 15 months and all that was doing is really just giving you like he said with the advancements in, in technology for the emergency medicine we have to now perform that and show that we are competent in that before we can graduate. So it's about 15 months and I believe now it's it's even closer between fire and EMS almost a two-year program. So almost two years for all the skills and knowledge to be able to put you in a sometimes very chaotic unpredictable medical emergency, not in the best situation, sometimes in dim light, not obviously a sterile environment, right. 
And with all of that going on, you have to initiate patient care, determine what's going on with the patient, and initiate life-saving measures immediately. Absolutely. Okay. So for those uh, out there in the audience, we've talked about nine months of training versus two years. Mm -hmm. um, I'd also like to touch on over 30 years of experience um, and for paramedics that went through the initial programs, I want to assure our citizens that not only have they received significant additional training, each time that there is a new change in the curriculum, we as a department are very diligent to make sure that our personnel, whether they were trained initially within one scope or another, all are brought up to speed and, and constantly trained. Uh, can either of you gentlemen talk about the, the training regimen we go through during a typical year to make sure that we're prepared for the citizen's emergency? Uh, well, like Dan said, you know, we're doing at least monthly trainings for emergency medicine. With that, we do fire trainings. We're constantly out in the, out in the public doing all kinds of pub ed stuff and, and better helping the citizens understand of what we really do as a fire department. Um, the training, continuing education through the state of Ohio, currently for a paramedic, it's about 86 continuing education hours that we have to recertify every three years. Um, and like you said, if there's something new or something out there, we follow the Greater Miami Valley uh, standing orders and we have to comply and be, again be competent and show that we're competent in that change. So not only do we at Kettering Fire meet the minimum training requirements, on average our personnel receive about 100 hours or over 100 hours of training every year mm -hmm. in a variety of emergency management skills to ensure that we're ready uh, and prepared for whatever emergency may come. Um, so let's start to talk now a little bit about the technology and, and the equipment that is um, that we deploy today comparatively. Dan, when you first came on, um, many departments carried what was called a three-lead cardiac mm -hmm. monitor, and you referenced the term EKG, and, and that's, that's us being able to take a snapshot of what's going on in the heart in a, a relatively basic interpretation. It's just one view of what's going on with the heart. Tell us a little bit about that compared to what we do today with, with our modern day equipment. Well, the monitor we used only enabled you to put leads, leads on the body, which the leads are what helps read what the monitor actually is uh, picking up. We put three on, and it gave us just a few views of the heart, and certainly we didn't see a lot of parts of the heart where a and, and, uh, heart attack could be occurring, so we would miss them frequently. Um, so, you know, technology needed to expand from there. Another thing with those monitors, when we uh, had to shock somebody's heart, if it needed to be shocked, we had to use paddles. We actually had to put some gel on paddles, rub them together, and actually shock somebody. And there was a huge danger in you yourself getting shocked. And I must admit, I one time did, did receive a <laughs> little bit of that, and it didn't feel good. So um, I was glad to see that technology as one of our major changes over the years. Um, but those techniques were the found foundation for what we have now. But it was very basic that we could do. We certainly couldn't uh, evaluate the victim or the person very much at all. And so some of the technology changes, so let's spend just a little bit of time on the cardiac monitor aspect Absolutely. of it. Um, our department invested a significant amount in additional equipment over the years to make sure our personnel have everything they need to adequately care for our patients. Absolutely. This piece of equipment, the LifePak 15, is one of those investments in our ability to provide care. Yes. Um, like you said, it, it's completely changed. It's evolved to only better uh, everyone that has to be put on this monitor. Um, just this, something as simple as even taking a blood pressure through the monitor or putting them on a pulse oximetry, we're able to detect that versus the old three leads weren't able to do that. Um, like he said, the EKG. We have a way of taking a 12 lead EKG, which gives us a lot more views of the heart and we're better able to read that. Now, with that though, we can now take a picture of it, print it off, We'll read it and interpret what it says. If necessary, we can actually transmit wirelessly to the receiving facility and let the emergency room doctor take a picture or take a peek at what we see as well. If he agrees with what we see, we can activate what we call a cardiac alert program um, that will get the cath lab ready, the emergency room ready, and get the cardiologist ready. And then we can actually take the patient into the emergency room for a brief stop. And if necessary, they'll go straight to the cath lab and get whatever heart attack problem they have going on, hopefully resolved in a very short amount of time. What that will do is decrease the hospital stay time for you know, days versus weeks is what they were staying. 
And not only does it decrease hospital stay, but it's truly saving lives. Absolutely. Um, and again, to compare and contrast, in 1983, if you were having chest pain, you would be placed on a heart monitor. That monitor would give a snapshot that yes, there's something going on in your heart, but it wouldn't tell the full picture. We would take the patient to the hospital um, and the hospital would have to do a whole lot of tests and after a period of time, sometimes significant, then they would notify a cardiologist to come in and look at that patient. Um, today with our modern technology, as, as Brett, you said, the cardiac monitor, the, the equipment that we're taking to the house allows not only the emergency room, but often the cardiologist to see what we're seeing just a few minutes after we've taken that. Mm -hmm. uh, if the patient is serious in nature, they have a blockage going on in their heart, that cardiologist is leaving his home about the time we're leaving the, the patient's house to head to the hospital, that cardiologist and his team for the, the catheterization lab are coming to the hospital, drastically reducing the amount of time to get that artery opened back up, right. drastically improving patient outcomes. So this cardiac alert program has been one of the big success stories of this region. And just a few short years ago, we weren't able to do that. We didn't have the technology, we didn't have the, the system in place working well with the hospitals and the cardiologist to save these lives. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about pulse oximetry um, and blood pressures. Effectively, this piece of equipment allows us to do additional patient assessments that we simply couldn't do in the right. past. Right, we were able to better, better serve the patient with this. We can do multiple things off of this unit at one point in time. And like Dan said, they had the paddles. We've, we've now switched to pads, which will stick to the patients themselves. And, and it's, it's better for us as well. That way we don't have to injure ourselves, like Dan said. Mm -hmm. So it's a safer environment mm -hmm. for the crews, safer. better medical technology. And, and both of you had to go through extensive additional training to, to know how to utilize this in new equipment and interpret the results. Absolutely. Correct. Okay, excellent. Um, let's move back to, um, to Dan for a minute on, if you arrived on a patient um, when you first came on who heart has stopped and they were no longer breathing, what was the method that you could try to circulate oxygenated blood to that patient to try and keep them alive? Well, CPR, uh, we, uh, we learned how to do CPR and that was the most effective way to help try to keep that person alive because we're circulating blood every time we do compressions. Uh, and from the time it takes for us to start with a patient and get them to the hospital, if we didn't do CPR, if we didn't do some of these skills that we've learned, most likely the patient would not survive. So CPR has been as a phenomenal thing for people to know as well as us in the profession to help these people survive that significant uh, cardiac arrest um, incident they've had. And from a, a personnel safety and staffing standpoint, it would take us dedicating one to two people to perform CPR and how safe is it to do CPR in the back of a moving medic en route to the hospital? Well, we become possible flying objects ourselves because there's really no way to secure ourselves in the back of the medic while we're doing CPR. So it's very unsafe for the person to be unrestrained back there in a kneeling or standing position. So it was a lot of danger for us and people have definitely been injured from that. Okay, and, and again, the theme of our, our talk today is how has EMS emerged and, and evolved over the years. Brett, can you talk about a device that now helps us to perform that same function of circulating blood and, and saving patients in a little bit more efficient and safer manner. Yes, absolutely. Now, we'll still do manual compressions if necessary. This is just a device that will help us in the event that we have one here, which we luckily enough today, we'll show you the demonstration for it. Um, what this is gonna do for us is gonna take the place of the person who's doing the manual compressions on the chest themselves. Uh, what you said, we had to dedicate one, two, possibly three people to properly do it compressions because we have to rotate compressors every two minutes because yes it is a very tiring aspect we want to make sure we're doing high quality CPR all the time this machine will always do high quality CPR all the time for us you simply turn it on it's sized to each patient the patient would be laying here it's a standard backboard uh, it takes the place of where your hands would normally do the compressions on the chest you size it you lock it into place and then you would actually just hit go and it's done. The compressions are done for us. What this allows us to do now, I'll turn it off so I can talk here. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, what this allows us to do is we're freeing up an additional personnel on the scene to do those many tasks that we have to do. Somebody's having to draw up cardiac drugs, get an IV, do the breathing tube, get the patches on for people, get information about what happened, why we're here, all that stuff. There's a lot of people, so we ha that's another reason why we send the fire engine and an ambulance for emergency medical scenes like this. Um, not only is this going to do compressions, but I mean, they're going to be completely uninterrupted. Before, if we had to shock or defibrillate a patient, we'd have to make sure everyone was clear. This unit being in place, we're actually able to keep this unit on and continue to go while we defibrillate the patient. It's not going to disrupt, disrupt or bother anything on this medical equipment itself. Um, you spoke about having crews unrestrained in the back of an ambulance. That's no longer an issue. We can actually safely restrain all of our members in the back when this unit's in place because it's not going to have to, we're not going to have to stand up and do the compressions. It's taking the place of that person who would be standing. Um, it's just an overall one of the latest and greatest and best advancements as, as far as I've seen as far as my 12 years in the career. So the key, <coughs> key thing for folks at home, this does not change. If we were to do manual CPR versus utilizing this piece of equipment, the effects of CPR are still going to take place. So if we were to do manual CPR on a patient, we're still circulating. This just allows us to use technology for some efficiency and safety when it's available and when right. we're able to deploy it. We may not place this on every cardiac arrest patient um, that we respond on, but it is one more tool for, for us to use when appropriate. Absolutely. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. I, uh, I'd like to segue now. Uh, we've talked a lot about the equipment. We've talked a lot about the training. I want to touch briefly on the, the compassion side, the, the personal uh, and emotional aspects of emergency medical care. Um, we can disqualify our, our patients with our expertise and all of our equipment and all of our, our technology, but in reality, patient care is coming from the heart and it's, it's coming in a compassionate manner. So I'd like for each of you to just talk a little bit about your experiences with providing that patient care and getting to be able to, to have the opportunity to respond to somebody on probably one of the worst days of their life. Well, one of the things I always like to, um, when I go in on a call, is approach it as if it's myself or somebody in my family. How would they want to be treated? How would I want to treat them? So I always try to, and I hope everybody I work with, and hopefully industry-wide we do this, we just treat everybody with due, with due respect and try to do the most and the best we can for them. So, you know, I'm going to treat them like family. I'm going to, uh, but I'm also going to have to step back and go like, okay, I know I have to start an IV and that's going to hurt, but it's going to be benefit them. So you have to look at the things you're doing. Are they really benefiting somebody or not? And you just, I mean, you have to love this job. You have to love being able to, you know, deal with the different types of people. But if you take the same approach, thinking everybody's, everybody's a person, everybody means something, then it just, it's, you know, it, that's the way you have to approach it in order to love the job and stay in it as long as, as, long as I have. And to be able to say that after that many years of, of doing patient care is, is a tribute to your character and the approach you've taken for our citizens. Um, Brett? Like you said, it's going to be the worst day of their lives when they call us. They, they called 911 for a reason. They needed our help, so we need to be there to make sure and express that we're here to help. Um, you had mentioned before that you know it's not always the best sterile or, or most widely led or, or the situation that we encounter. So we always have to come into this picture assuming that you know we're here to help regardless of what situation we put in. It could be two in the afternoon or two o'clock in the morning. We're there for you. Um, you know we're here to help regardless of what it is. And, they're with us for a relatively short amount of time with our hospital transport times being relatively short. So we have to do a lot in that short amount of time, but we're still having to provide that high quality care. And it truly is, is an honor and an opportunity for us to get to engage our citizens in these difficult moments and try and make their day a little bit better. And I think we are, we are blessed in our department to have phenomenally skilled and experienced personnel to provide that care but also compassionate uh, people who really feel strongly about the, the need to provide it with dignity and integrity as we go about our day. All right, thank you very much for, for giving us kind of a um, history of how EMS has, has evolved, um, how we as a department have uh, addressed challenges in the community with technology, with training. Um, this month is, is National Preparedness Month. 
Uh, and as such, I want to talk briefly on being prepared for emergency medical uh, um, emergencies and uh, fire emergencies. So, Brett, what would be important for people to know about having smoke detectors in their house? Are they important? Should they have them? Where should they have them? Absolutely, it's very important. Like you said, it, next month will be a Fire Prevention Month that will take place, or Fire Prevention Week, I apologize. October 4th through the, I believe, the 10th. Um, this year's theme is hear the beep where you sleep. It's important to have a smoke detector on e in every bedroom. Not only in every bedroom, but make sure you have one in every floor of the residence. Um, what they're asking is that way, it, it's a combination if you have both an ionization and a photoelectric smoke detector, which will help detect uh, uh, fast flame fires versus you know the small smoldering fires that might smoke for a while. Um, it, it's best to always have them, like I said, in every bedroom. That way you're alerted early and in the event of an emergency, you're able to get out in a safely and timely manner. Okay, and Dan, for the exit plan, is it important to have an exit plan uh, and, and have thought through how am I gonna get out if one particular way is blocked by smoke or fire? Oh, it's very important. We go in and out through doors all the time. We know those are exits that we can go out, but if we discover fire at what we would feel as our regular exit, we need to know there's more than one way out of every room. There's windows, there's other rooms you can go into. We need to be planning ahead in case our expected route gets blocked. So if you're expecting to live on, if you live on a second floor and you're expecting to go downstairs and get out through the front door and smoke's pouring up through there, that's not going to be safe to do. So you need to have a fire escape plan in your house to know where the windows are and how to get out and, and discuss that with your family. How am I going to get out? Do I have a ledge? Do I have a tree? Uh, how am I going to do that? Every, every house is different, so you have to work your own house uh, independently on that. So it's important to take time, and we'd encourage every citizen to do that immediately after viewing this, the same day. It's easy to put that off. We want working smoke detectors on every level of the home, and in addition to that, inside every bedroom. Uh, there's a value with sleeping with the door closed, so if a fire does erupt somewhere else in that house, even a hollow cord door has been proven to keep the products of smoke and fire out and keep someone safe. From an emergency medical sense, trying to be prepared. The Kettering Fire Department has an emergency medical magnet, um, in which case we have additional information for, for our citizens who have medical problems and have uh, medical uh, or medicines that they take, maybe allergies, uh, specialists. How important is filling one of these out if, if you're a citizen of Kettering and you have medical um, concerns? Well, I'll tell you from an EMS standpoint, when we arrive on scene, if we can get a hold of this right away, that saves us a lot of questions, a lot of trying to find your medications, find someone that can give us history. It's right there. You keep it up to date and it's right there. Absolutely. And uh, we can take that and, and we can get to the hospital quicker because we don't have to waste time trying to figure out what, what we, information we need. Okay, so to summarize, our citizens can do a lot of things on their own to be prepared. Um, to take time to think through what emergencies could happen and talk with each other about what is their plan of action to be able to address that. If they want to learn CPR, the fire department does offer CPR classes on a monthly basis. If they want to make sure their child is safe in a car seat on a monthly basis, we will help them to make sure their child is safe. And if any of our discussions today have prompted any additional questions, we would encourage our residents to call us at our headquarters and we'll be able to help you. Thank you for joining us today uh, and have a great day.